phone. And we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, no adjustments. First item is the approval of minutes for the following meetings, Monday, May 23rd, 2022, Executive Session, 4 p.m., Monday, May 23rd, 2022, Executive Session at 5 p.m., and the same date, same year, same school committee meeting at 6 p.m. Um, looking for a motion to approve the minutes as presented. So moved, seconded. John and John. All right. All in favor, all in favor. Awesome. Approval of minutes. No public comments, no communication. Oh. Actually, I, Matt and I were invited by the uh, Charter Review Committee to do the uh, budget portion of the Charter Review. Um, there's a public hearing this Thursday night here at 6 o'clock that the public ought to know about. It also, one of the recommendations is that the new um, Budget Review Committee will be made up of the seven city councilors, the five of us, and up to five public appointed members. Just something to be aware of. It's, for us, it's redundant meetings that we've already um, done. We will have already approved or gone through our budget with, with Matt. And then um, sitting through more meetings in March, my recommendation at the time when Matt and I sat there was maybe a majority of um, City councils being four and three of us, that makes some public meetings that the public would be invited to. So again, you, you need to be aware of that, that you've been uh, encouraged to participate. So anyway, Thursday night, six o'clock right here. Thank you. Okay, committee reports, construction projects. Sure, I, et cetera. I, yep, just a quick update. Uh, after the last meeting, we talked about um, uh, issuing the change order that was going to start to work on the closeout of the program of the project uh, for the high school and technical center project also with the um, uh, change orders as well as the punch list with an update we have issued that that did go to Hutter uh, we issued that on May 24th to date we have not heard back but that is not um, uh, I don't think we're uh, overly concerned about that in the sense that that was probably not one of those change orders that was going to be able to be executed at their level. It was probably going to have to be something that goes up the chain. So um, even though we haven't heard anything, we are waiting. My plan is to reach out to talk to the Hutter representative that I worked closely with on the project this week, just to check in, make sure they received it, try to get an update to see what, we, see what our next steps are. So that is the, uh, that's the latest construction update. Schedule advisory committee, we were hoping to pull off a meeting last week. Uh, we went and scheduled that and then I decided to postpone that meeting and reschedule it at a later date. We just, as much as we were trying to get it done last week, we were not able to pull it off. Um, it's a busy time of year in terms of at the end of the school year with a lot of the different things going on. So our hope is that we're looking to try to schedule something, uh, and this is once again another busy week, we're hoping to try to schedule something uh, next week. I am trying to work around where I think it's important for uh, the majority of people to be at the meeting, and that would include our representatives from the school committee, um, Paula and Jen, and also Don Jamison, who's kind of been there from day one. So we're trying to coordinate people's schedule to be able to work on that so that we can kind of wrap up uh, where we were getting on the feedback. We really were talking a lot about staff feedback. We're looking to get student feedback to try to wrap that up um, in a good, a good uh, pausing point for us, but having a hard time scheduling that meeting, but we'll keep working on it. Okay, and Sanford Performing Arts Committee. Um, we have had a lot of dance um, competitions and dance recitals. We've had thousands of guests. We had Jazz Tapping Dance Academy, Dance Studio of Maine South, and Northern Explosion. Um, this weekend, we're going to welcome Stepping Out Dance Center from Saco, and the following weekend is the Sharon Arnold Lux School of Dance from Kennebunk. 
um, you know, we've developed a reputation for being um, the preeminent stage for dance performances, so that is really good for us. It, um, since we've started hosting, or not hosting, but renting out the space to these dance companies, we have had a total revenue of over $20,000, so that's always good to hear. Um, and we've got a great floor for it. I mean, we've got athletic sprung dance floor, top-notch facilities, and uh, friendly staff, and like I've said before during these meetings, we apparently have the best stage um, all around, so that's really good. Um, our 2021-2022 Spotlight Series is wrapping up this Friday, June 24th, with the National Tour of Menopause the Musical. It's one night only. Uh, advanced tickets are very, uh, sales are very strong. It's a great show. The New York Times says it's impossible not to laugh, so we dare you to buy some tickets and come and try not to laugh. It's supposed to be a great, great show. Um, on May 27th, the national tour of Dogman, the musical, came to our theater. This kid-friendly off-Broadway show is based on the very popular children's book series by Dave Pilkey and produced by Theater Works USA. So every student in our district from grades one through three were able to enjoy the show for free, which is great because um, one of our goals was to make sure that we could have theater experience be affordable for everybody in the district and everybody in the community, so, and for everybody to have a chance to experience theater. Most of them had never been to the uh, PAC Center before because they were in kindergarten or younger when COVID began. So the show received rave reviews from teachers and students, and it was just a wonderful experience for everybody. And finally, we're excited to announce our very first outdoor performance. On Saturday, July 16th, we are presenting Strafford Wind Symphony at Goodall Park. This is in collaboration with the city of Sanford. The ensemble will perform on a stage at second base. Guests can bring their own chairs to sit on the infield or sit in the grandstand. Tickets and information for this and all shows is online at sanfordpack.org. And that's it. That sounds like it'll be a fun way to spend a day in the summer. All right, moving on to superintendent reports. Sure, before I kick it over to John Paul for a student representative report, a um, couple of things I just want to uh, mention. Obviously, since our last meeting, school safety has been really um, a high um, um, item in, in, uh, on people's minds with the uh, tragedy that happened in Texas. And so I want to uh, assure people that that's something that we've been working with um, in terms of uh, making sure that we are looking at our safety procedures to make sure that what uh, they're doing is uh, necessary. Steve Boussier and I met uh, last week with Chief Anderson. We met with um, Joe Jourdain, the school resource officer at the Sanford Middle School. We also met with Mike Gordon. Mike, as you remember, was the former SRO at the high school. And so um, we had a very productive meeting uh, with them. Uh, we reviewed our current protocols, and right now I think we are uh, doing a really nice job when it comes to lockdown procedures, but we also know that uh, our, we have to make sure our procedures are updated and they're also evolving. And so uh, with that, that's work that we're going to be able to um, undertake. Uh, we started mapping out a plan. The police department is very interested in supporting the ALICE program. And that ALICE program is something that I know we had looked upon uh, prior to COVID. Uh, it's very popular throughout the country, also throughout the state of Maine, and a number of schools in York County are using it. It's a safety program, and what that does, it offers additional options to students and staff in dealing with any armed intruder situations. So you're in, ALICE is what it's called. It stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. Those are the five components and the basis of the program. And one of the concerns that I had that's been addressed by that program, it's very age appropriate when it comes to the training. So we have our um, end of the year administrative team meeting next week. Uh, Joe Jourdain is gonna come and be able to provide an overview of the ALICE program. Uh, to the administrators. We had already scheduled uh, two meetings in July with the, our safety committee, with the administrators on the safety committee, so that we can be able to look at uh, our procedures, but plan our rollout, implementation, and our training in our next steps. 
Um, so that work is ongoing. One thing also in talking with the police department, uh, they are looking at also for their own training, providing some active shooter training, uh, and we're looking to do that, and it's gonna work out nicely, I think, that the Margaret Chase Smith School, since we're not having any summer program there, will be able to come back and do that. So I know I wanted to let people know that those are uh, things that we are uh, taking a close look and, and paying close attention to so that we can continue to make sure that our, our schools stay safe. I'm very proud of um, the efforts that we've made through our renovations to really try to make sure that uh, getting access to our, uh, our schools and the, state, and the vestibules that we've added uh, are an extra step with that. We do have one school, College A Lamb School, where we're looking at trying to uh, put in uh, a vestibule there or trying to at least look at options to be able to come back and do that. So those are just some of the things um, for the safety procedures going that way. Um, John Paul, ready to go for um, student rep report. Sure, so as you mentioned, it is a very busy time. Um, finals are coming up this week with finals starting Wednesday and going through Friday at the high school. Uh, the seniors are also in full swing of all their activities. Uh, Ward's banquet is tonight, followed by a games night, so the seniors will enjoy that with graduation on Wednesday. Uh, spring sports are coming to a wrap. Track officially ended Saturday with the state meet. We do have e either three or four uh, that did qualify for nationals, um, so that will be happening, I think, on the 11th. Um, <clears throat> but baseball and lacrosse and all the other spring sports are still going, but still coming down to an end. Uh, and yeah, I think that pretty much concludes all that I have. I'm happy to announce that we are, I was able to uh, break away this afternoon. Our boys lacrosse team hosted a playoff game. They hosted Massabesic and came out victorious. Um, so congratulations to them. And I was also able to slide down to Goodall Park to catch the end of the baseball game. And we were in that playoff game and we were victorious there beating Kenny Buck with that. So congratulations there. And our girls lacrosse team is also hosting a playoff game tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock right at Alumni Stadium. For it. Um, uh, usually the, uh, when you, I give my report, there's usually um, the school news is my favorite part. And then there's the return to in-person learning and continuity of instruction part that is not my favorite part. So, but I am uh, pleased to announce tonight that I uh, am ready to uh, say that this will probably be the last return to in-person learning continuity instruction update. You may ask why? Well, York County has moved back to green, so we're at a low level. The positive cases in our district uh, have uh, decreased significantly. If you remember, we had a little bit of a bump there a few weeks ago that was concerning. So we are planning to sunset uh, COVID at the end of this school year. And so that's not a decision we're making by ourselves. That's being done in consultation with the main CDC, the main Department of Education, and main Department of Health and Human Services. So the um, SOP, the Standing Operating Procedures developed by Maine CDC for responding to positive cases, that's gonna sunset. In its place, we're gonna follow some pre-existing um, communicable diseases protocols that are already in place and have been in place uh, prior to COVID. Uh, we're gonna stop updating our district's dashboard for positive cases. Um, the main school's 30-day COVID-19 case report dashboard that the Department of Education uses is also going to be sunset. Um, knowing that COVID-19 remains a notifiable condition, if we are uh, aware, we are going to report all laboratory confirmed COVID-19 tests uh, to the main CDC within 48 hours uh, with that. We're also going to monitor our absenteeism and to know that if we hit that 15% threshold between staff and students, then obviously that's gonna be something where we would uh, notify the appropriate people and take the, the necessary precautions. What you're gonna see is probably us going back to also recommending health strategies, um, you know, the everyday operations where we want our people to stay up to date on their vaccinations, we want them to continue to stay home when they're sick, we want them to, um, uh, proper hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette 
and also continue to make sure our ventilation is where it needs to be with that. And then that way we'll continue to monitor, but I feel confident that we're gonna be able to uh, put this behind us and uh, move it on with that. So that is the uh, return to in-person learning and continuity instruction update. Any questions? <laughs> we'll have a celebration plan at a later date. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and okay, now the uh, favorite part is moving on to some updates from our school, new, uh, from our various schools. We'll start at Sanford High School. Jean Paul talked about it's an exciting time as we're wrapping up and getting ready for graduation this week, uh, starting with the awards night. Um, right now, and as well as the uh, games night, and then tomorrow night is the senior banquet. But this is, this is something I think is pretty neat. We had five Sanford High School students that were enrolled in the first uh, WABAN uh, Sanford High School partnership during this spring semester at the high school. These students completed a rigorous DSP and CPR first aid credential. What is DSP, you wonder? Direct support professional, that's a DSP. They work directly with people who have intellectual or developmental disabilities. These credentials are transferable uh, throughout the uh, United States, and so we're very proud of these students for completing that work. The DSPs must be 17 years old to gain employment in the field, and uh, what is also as exciting is the partnership will continue next year, and we're gonna offer two DSP classes at the high school. We want to give our thanks out to Waban and Sanford High School School Counseling Department and the Sanford High School Administration for helping to get the program off the ground. And there's a picture of our newly DSP certified students and representatives from Waban. So congratulations. That's pretty neat. Uh, SRTC, uh, a lot of things going on there. Um, on May 23rd, they partnered with Pratt and Whitney to hold their first ever signing day for SRTC students. You might hear sometimes their signing days. I know when our student athletes, for example, are going on. Well, guess what? We had a signing day for those who've committed to starting their career employment career with Pratt and Whitney. And so as part of that, there was an introductory presentation and then there was also, some workshop, also workshops related, everything from some uh, important skills to resume writing and interview skills. Also received a tour of Pratt and Whitney facility. So, um, there's some students um, who accepted positions as part of this event, pictured there, and we also have some representatives from Pratt and Whitney as well. So uh, pretty cool uh, opportunity for those students. The SRTC recognition night was uh, Thursday, May 26th. We held it outside at Alumni Stadium. Um, it was, it was uh, well done. It got a little cool there towards the end. Um, over 250 students were honored for completing either the one or two year programs at SRTC. Uh, I wanna thank Sarah for being able to uh, record that. And if you wanna be able to check that out, you can see it on the WSSR TV YouTube page um, for that. Uh, we had a step up day for SRTC. That was done last Tuesday. And so the students who had been accepted to SRTC for the next school year spent half their school day meeting their teachers and learning about the program they plan to attend next year with that. That's, so that's a nice event because the current SRTC students can really um, serve as mentors um, for that. So uh, that went well. Sanford Middle School, um, a lot of things going on there. There's some uh, of our student artists using their ruler skills to draw giant popsicles and create a tie-dye effect with neon oil pastels. Um, also, last week we had the incoming fifth grade uh, night for students and parents, and here's a picture of some of the fifth graders um, who created a video um, for about Sanford uh, Middle School for the incoming fifth graders and their families, and that video was shown at the event uh, with that, so um, big kudos to that group. Uh, students on the leadership team also helped usher folks into the Welcome to SMS uh, evening uh, as well. They answered questions and provided tours to incoming fifth graders and their families. And also, um, Ms. Allen and Mr. Sanborn with their aquaponics program at the middle school. Uh, they are hosting some of the elementary students who are able to come over and check out that greenhouse and aquaponics uh, system with that. 
So kudos there as they were able to come back and see the cool things happening there at Sanford Middle School. Over at Carl J. Lamb, we had um, the, uh, Ms. Sheila from the Springvale Public Library come in uh, as she rotated through the classes to talk about the summer reading program that's going on and encourage our students to continue reading. Uh, also at Carl J. Lamb, the Chewankee Traveling Natural History Program came in and uh, as you can see there, there's a picture of them providing students with uh, some uh, intriguing animals and natural phenomena. The pre presentations had live animals, rare specimens, and engaging activities with that. I was over there and it looked pretty, pretty cool. I actually stopped by and listened for a while um, with that. Uh, and then there's another picture there of the presentations, uh, owls of mane, fur feathers and feet, animal adaptations, bugmobile and scales and tails. So thank you to Chewankee for putting that off. And then our first grade, uh, there's some field trips there. They went to Smiling Hill Farm and uh, Bola Rama for first and second grade. And there was also a math night uh, that we were able to come back for parents um, to come in and do math with their children. Uh, to be able to look at the different things going on math. And there's some uh, mathematicians in action. Ice Cream Social uh, was also part of that math night uh, to help with that and uh, another huge success there. So a big thank you to our PTA as well as Shaw's Ridge for uh, donating the uh, ice cream to be able to make that happen. Over at Margaret Chase Smith School, there's the mighty school, uh, cool students for this week. Uh, as we move into a new month, the focus uh, this month is on honesty. And I thought this was pretty cool. The fourth graders ran the school for a day. Uh, there was an opportunity when uh, the other three grade levels were on a field trip. And so with doing that, fourth graders were able to kind of take over the school. Um, so good for them as they were able to come back and do a lot of different fun activities right there for their school. And I, uh, with that, and then library news, um, they're able to, uh, with all of our um, students, being able to select a book to take home for summer reading with that. And so we had over 1,100 new books uh, for that, for people to be able to take two of those uh, for it. And then um, also the ABC countdown uh, for first grade and some of the kindergarten classrooms, uh, that's something, a pretty cool event to do at the end of the school years. Uh, end of the school year in terms of being able to help with that. NMCS had their carnival uh, last uh, this past week. Families and students participated in field games, face painting, the coyote mask making, butterfly craft making, and planting seeds of flowers uh, with that. So also a lot of treats and food on hand for that with that. And it looks like students had the opportunity to pie some staff members in the process to make it a fun night. Sanford Pride Elementary, uh, able to, Ed Cormier uh, from the FAA joined the fourth graders and completed a STEM activity about flight with that. And that was able to uh, return to field trips and guest speakers has been able to really help Pride uh, as well as all of our schools for that. And then finally, um, Sanford Community Adult Education, they've helped 15 people earn their high school credentials via the HiSET. And so there's 15 people right now who now have some opportunities uh, available to them uh, with that. A student passed uh, two more of the five exams just yesterday. And with that, they can see that that's something that they could have done sooner. And the final picture, as we mentioned, is graduation this week. And so that's a big uh, moment for obviously our seniors who are graduating. But also remember, it's also um, promotion as well for uh, those in fourth grade who will be going to fifth grade next year and those in eighth grade who will be going to the high school next year. Uh, step up activities going on uh, this week to be able to help with those transitions to do that. So a big thank you to uh, our students and our staff who have been organizing those with that. And that's school news. That was awesome. Thank you. That's always the best part. Okay, director's reports. Bethany, are you going first? I'm going to introduce the first two. Um, so oh, what so I'd like is to have Eric right. Benham and Chambri Kumka come join you guys, and they're going to tell you a little bit about our gifted and talented program here at the district. Okay. All yours? All you have to do is hit the enter button and it moves forward. Okay. Yep. Is 
it possible to have any of our slides? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just snap your fingers and it happens. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so first, thank you for having us in. Um, we appreciate the time to, to talk a little bit about the program. Um, I'm Eric Benham, K-4, so I work at the three elementary schools. And I'm Shambri Kumka, and I work at the middle school and at the high school. All right, and so we thought it would be fun to um, start with a little bit of a warm-up activity. So I'm sorry, how do I move? Ah, right in here. Perfect. Um, so a warm-up problem for you. I'll give you a little think time, and then uh, <laughs> I'll spoil it. So the problem goes like this. In a room behind a closed door, there is a light. You cannot see into the room from the outside. Just outside of the door are these three switches. You may only open the door to check the light one time. You know that the lamp is currently off. Can you come up with a plan to figure out, without any doubt, which of the switches controls the light? So I would normally give a bit more time, but I'll, <laughs> I'll spoil it in sake of time for this evening. Um, we wanted to share this problem with you. Just It's an idea of some of the activities that we might do with students just to kind of get their brains going, particularly as warm-ups. Um, in this problem, the solution, or I should say one of the solutions, is you flip the first switch, wait for several minutes, then flip it off, then quickly flip on the second switch, open the door. If the light is on, then you know it was the second switch. If the light is off, you would go touch the bulb. And if the bulb's warm, you would know it had been from the first switch being on for several minutes. And if the bulb is cool, you would know that it must be the third switch. Um, so I'll come back to that problem in a moment. But um, <laughs> something that oftentimes there are questions about. I, I, I'll speak for everyone. I spent way much more time thinking about that. Than, uh, so. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for that. Yeah, well, we, we thought about saving it to the end, but we didn't want you to be distracted mulling it over the whole presentation. So, um, <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll touch on the identification of the screening process just briefly. Um, so here in Sanford, all, all children are open to the screening and selection process on an annual basis. And we have a selection committee that kind of makes those determinations, typically in April or May. The district screening begins for all second graders, and we use a universal testing of a cognitiv cognitive abilities test, um, referred to as the COGAT. We also look at NWEA achievement history, and then we feel strongly that teachers know their students best, so we, we ask for a lot of teacher input um, using teaching rating scales that have specific characteristics of gifted and high ability learners. And with that information, we create what we call a GT pool for grades in three and four. Each year, we do an annual review of those pooled students. Uh, we also look at any new referrals, so it isn't, um, you know, we, we take them at second, and then you have to wait until fourth grade for the next time. So at any point, um, a new referral can be made. And then with that annual review, at the end of fourth grade and eighth grade, we kind of do more of a complete review, so we include updated testing. Um, and here it says on the designated aptitude test, currently we're using the COGAT, but there are other tests out there. Uh, Students may be screened for GT services at any grade level based on referrals or scores on achievement tests. And we really try to use a variety of data points so that there isn't one. Um, I think oftentimes families uh, and, and possibly even teachers think that there's maybe a magic GT test and, and we try to really avoid that. So we look at a variety of data point which includes primarily the NWAs, uh, the COGAT, and then also that teacher ratings and feedback. Um, and, and also any other relevant information that may, may be available to us. I'll let you speak a bit about right. this. And then just some of our general roles that apply to both of us at no, no matter which grade level. Um, we coordinate with school counselors for course placement and servicing social emotional needs of those identified students. So I kind of think of it as our, our caseload and we coordinate with school counselors on really anything that might come up regarding that student. I'm included on emails about concerns and things like that. And then obviously we discuss uh, course placements at the end of a school year for the following school year as far as clusters and things like that. Uh, we collaborate with teachers in servicing gifted and high ability students. So that might be helping plan a lesson with them. It might be co-teaching a lesson with them. It might be coming in to do, um, you know, I know you've done some mindset lessons mm -hmm. and things like that. So it can look any number of different ways. Uh, we work with students either individually or in groups based on their needs. Um, most of the time it's in small groups, but there are um, varying ways that we can work with those students. Uh, we introduce contests and ex extracurricular opportunities for them, things like math olympiads, um, essay contests, um, 3M science contests, those are just some examples there. And then um, we identify and monitor 
monitor students for surfaces. So like you mentioned, we go through our identification process, but then we're also monitoring them you know, yearly and throughout the year um, to change our surfaces based on their needs. Um, so getting more specific just to kind of the, the grade spans that we each service, um, I'll kind of talk briefly some of the images around the outside at the end here. Um, so in grades K2, primarily I serve as a resource for teachers, so collaborating with classroom teachers, providing opportunities for differentiation. Um, I, I try to go into classrooms from time to time to do whole class or small group activities. And then there is also the opportunity for um, either pull in or push out at those grade levels on a case by case basis because as, as I mentioned, most of the screening happens at the end of second grade, um, but there are those students who come, in, come to us in the primary grades who, who really need a little bit of an extra push. Um, in grades three and four, that's where most of the students that I work with are. So I work directly with students who are identified in that GT pool, um, either through push in or pull out. And then during those times, it's kind of a combination of providing academic challenges and then also creative and critical thinking skills. And then occasionally I do try to go in and do whole class enrichment on topics such as growth mindset, perseverance and problem solving, and then opportunities for creative and critical thinking. So I'll explain kind of briefly to you all the same way that I explained it to students is the types of students that I work with. Um, we're all very intelligent and we all have different ways of being intelligent and different ways of thinking. The students that I work with might just think in a different way than many of us, um, or they may need opportunities to explore different styles of thinking. So a lot of the work that I do on with students is in activities geared towards divergent thinking, which we can think of as like our creative thinking, our yes and attitude, I call it. Um, and then also our convergent thinking, where it's more that critical thinking, where we're now narrowing down, thinking about the best possible choices and outcomes, as well as what we could call lateral thinking, uh, moving between the two. And so the activity, oh, I'm sorry. The uh, warm-up problem there is a great example for lateral thinking, where many of us could sit there maybe all day long and mull over a very logical, sequential way to get to the result, um, but it kind of required a little bit of a roundabout way to think, oh yeah, that's right, a light bulb would be warm if we left it on for several minutes. Um, that may not be the first thing we think of when we think about light switches going on and off. Um, so some of the pictures there, uh, a student working on a math problem. This particular one has elements that are unsolved, and so I like working on challenging problems with students, particularly reinforcing that being fast is not the same as being good at math. Um, lots of students will kind of develop a mindset that you have to be very quick, and they don't get a lot of experience with what we call productive struggle, so it's giving them opportunities to be okay with not getting to the answer right away. Um, uh, another picture there, we see a student with kind of flames on the eyes. That's getting at some of the social emotional learning. So I do work with fourth graders on understanding their learning profiles, their intelligence types, thinking about that. Um, this year was great with the comfort, the comfort level of uh, so many people on Zoom and, and Google Meets. We actually had a third grader who is very interested in deep space and black holes. Was able, we were able to contact um, the planetarium director Edward Herrick Gleason from University of Southern Maine, and so he did a, like a half hour interview where he wrote up his questions, and, and they had a conversation that I watched from the sideline um, <laughs> because they were talking about topics that I have very limited uh, understanding of. Um, so that, that was really nice. And then this, the next slide, a fly fly that can't fly. Um, so integrating some technology with students, they were working with uh, homophones and homographs, so doing that with small groups, and then also had the opportunity to go in a classroom. Um, for those of you working your way through that, fly can be like an adjective, they're very cool, fly the noun, the actual insect, um, and then fly the verb, like flying in the air, so there's a fly fly that can't fly. Uh, and the final picture there is a scamper activity, so creative problem solving. Uh, I try to get into classrooms and do, do some of those uh, in that particular one. It's ways to improve sales of candy canes um, using a, a tool that actually large corporations use the scamper technique. So that gives you kind of an idea of some of the, some of the activities that I might do with students and groups. So for grades five through eight of the middle school, um, I serve as a resource for teachers, again, for possibly planning differentiation activities, um, push into the classroom, um, et cetera. And then I work directly with students identified as gifted or high ability in tutorials or in pullout sessions. 
um, and I utilize that tutorial time uh, a lot this year for SEL lessons um, to talk about what it means uh, and maybe the faults of some of our gifted traits uh, like perfectionism and goal setting and things like that and then um, independent projects and other enrichment activities. And in grades nine through 12 at the high school, I serve more as a resource or student advocate for those identified students. And I might assist them with course pathways and so any social emotional needs that they might have. And for those meetings with those students, I utilize Spartan time so they can schedule time with me to discuss you know, if they have an, an, any interests in areas um, that they wanna know how to get you know, classes or um, put them in touch with people in the community that can help them. I was working with a student um, who's interested in starting a photography business, so got in touch with some uh, friends who have their own to put them together, you know, when she had some questions about contracts and things like that. Um, and then again, like the social emotional needs if they are just struggling in a class and need to talk that out and look at study skills and things like that. So my pictures uh, there on the bottom left, the three students, they won the Elk Drug Awareness Video um, Award for the state of Maine, and they went to a nice little banquet um, for that. Um, I'm still waiting to hear about the national contest, so I don't know, maybe fingers crossed. Um, the middle is another sort of puzzle that I did with students. Um, that I think drove them insane. But um, <laughs> so for that one, it's called the, it, it's a, I guess it was used in Yahoo as an interview puzzle, but you have a camel who needs to transport 3,000 bananas to the market, which is 1,000 kilometers away. Uh, he can carry at max 1,000 bananas at a time, and he eats one banana for every kilometer he goes. So what's the maximum number of bananas that, he, that can be delivered to the market? So we took a long time on that, and um, I, like I said, I think uh, I had some students very angry with me about it at the end, <laughs> but they figured it out, so they, they did a good job with that. And then on the bottom right was a lesson that I did during my tutorial time with a group of sixth graders um, during the Black History Month, and it was a lesson on Brown versus Board of Education and how, um, and how that case was decided. So some examples there, some things I've done with students. All right, um, so these are just sort of the numbers of students that we work with, and this includes both what we would refer to as the GT and high ability students. Um, so chapter 104 governs gifted and talented education in the state of Maine, and the Maine Department of Education says that this number will usually comprise 5% of the school population. So for some grades, we may be a little bit north of that, for others, um, right on, but it does kind of even out. Um, so in K-2, currently there's, there's two students, um, third and fourth grade, uh, 19 and 21 students respectively, and in those numbers that doesn't include necessarily students that teachers may just contact us about to say, hey, I've got this one student who, uh, you know, are, are there some things that we might be able to do or try? Uh, these are primarily the students that are receiving more direct services. And in fifth grade, we have seven students, sixth grade, 11, seventh grade, 12 students, eighth grade, 14, and then Total at the high school, 9 through 12, we have 41 students. With that, we will say thank you again for your time. Okay. Are there any questions that you guys have for us? about? We do have questions. So that's really fascinating. Uh, how long have each of you been with the district? Um, so I am now in my fifth year here. Yeah. This is my first year. Well, w welcome. I think John and I, uh, I'll speak for myself, but it's probably six years ago, maybe seven, one of the more intimidating meetings I participated in sitting up here was a group of parents who came in representing gifted and talented. That's what we called it, and we still do. And look, I've got three kids and seven grandkids, and I think they're all the brightest kids on earth, right? And you all would argue with me that yours are the brightest. So the delineation, and you talked about it well, there are additional one or two kids in each grade that you work with, and I do you feel comfortable, I don't want to say arguing, discussing with those parents who don't make that list? Uh, so, Because I mean, you really, it's the parent you're talking to, not right. the child. Yeah, and, and, and it is difficult, and, and as a parent myself of a, a younger child, of course, I think she's you know, the brightest and most wonderful um, and student. And, and I think one of the things that's, um, that can be difficult to communicate is that there are differences between the student who's, who's high achieving, who works hard, who does well in school, and, and to parents who have children like that, I say, wow, congratulations, you, know, that, you must feel so proud of your child. Um, not all, but, but some of the students that we work with, they 
may not always fit the model of, of being um, the student that's, you know, they're, they, have all, they, they don't have all the answers. Um, they've gone beyond that, and now they have all the questions. And so for those students, they do require a little bit more. Um, I think one other piece that can be challenging is every district determines how they're going to identify students. And so here in Sanford, um, I mentioned those, those pieces, the COGAT, the NWA, the teacher rating scales. If, if a family feels strongly that other tools should be included, we welcome that conversation. But we do have the tools that we use. Um, and it's not, I don't want to say it's a line in the sand, because it's very hard to put people, particularly children, into boxes and say, hey, these numbers define who you are and what you need. Um, so I, I encourage any family to reach out to us if they have questions. I think that's what's wonderful about this opportunity is to put ourselves out there a little bit more because it's a topic that many people do have questions about. Um, so but, I don't know. but having those parameters does help those conversations to yep. be able to go back to looking at, and again, not just one piece of data, but looking at the student as a whole, you know, even looking at student samples if we needed to, or, and a lot of it comes down to our experiences with the students as well um, and the teacher's feedback with, with students. So I, I don't think that, I know I personally have not yet had to have a difficult conversation regarding that, but I know that that is something that could happen, and I'm sure you've had to do that in the past. But I think that was why one of our goals this year was to have a pretty transparent identification process so that it wouldn't be an emotional issue. It would just be, here's, here's what we looked at, here's, you know, here's where your student placed in this score and that score, and here's the teacher feedback we got to have more of an objective view on that. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Follow up. I just, again, going back to that meeting, was it six years ago, seven years? You remember, remember that night? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we were looking for the back door. How do we get out of here? But it, it's ref, I find it refreshing to have you here presenting this today because it's, it's the answer maybe we were looking for several years ago. So thank you for yeah. what you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. I, I just, oh, sorry. Oh. Oh. Um, I, well, thank you both for your presentation. I will say that I really, um, along with everything else that you said, what struck me was that you've also talking to those students about, you know, um, being a perfectionist sometimes and, you know, the growth mindset and um, the perseverance because sometimes um, my experience with students that are so high functioning that they have a lot of anxiety about being perfect all the time. So I love that you have like, you know, um, SEL sort of part of that um, curriculum, if you will, just part of that conversation. So thank you. Yeah, thank no, you, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you very much. I have to be honest and tell you I'm glad they didn't give you the answer to that second riddle about the camel. <laughs> so we'll see who can figure it out first. No, not you, JP. Of course no. you do. No, no, no. no. <laughs> We've been working on trauma-informed practices, and that brings back some of the memories of me and some word problems back that we're going to just move on from. <laughs> Steve, ESEA report. Thank you. Thank you so much. OK, good evening. Um, it's that time of year again when we have our ESEA um, proposed um, projects and um, budget for you this evening. Um, earlier this spring um, in May, the ESEA um, advisory team met. We talked about what were some things that were going well and what were some challenges we were experiencing, both in terms of students and staff. And so um, ESEA stands for the Elementary Secondary Education Act, and that is how we get funding for various title projects. You've heard me speak before about Title I, Title II, and Title IV. So those are the funds we are talking about. Title I, um, Title I Part A funds may be used to meet the needs of children identified as being in the greatest need of service. Students must be selected using multiple um, educationally related objective criteria. The costs that are associated must be supplemented, supplemental and limited to services for eligible students in a targeted assistance program. So we are a targeted assistance uh, Title I district. Within that title, we also provide um, funds for our homeless students and funds for family engagement. 
Now, if we look at this year, our um, preliminary allocation for Title I is 1074983 That is a decrease of about $44,000. And that is the second year that we have seen a decrease, a substantial decrease in our funding. If we look at Title II, Title II, that's where we um, look at professional development. To boil it down, that's professional development for teachers, principals, and school leaders. This year, our allocation is 185, 895, um, and that also we saw a decrease of 17,745. If you look at Title IV, that's student support and academic enrichment programs. And this year, our allocation is 116,357, which is an increase of 4,168. Title IV, we saw an increase because we, our student population has gone up slightly. So that's why we see an increase in our Title IV allocation. Title II, that has to do with our staff to the EPS formula. And we're pretty, we have additional staff that we're paying out of the ESSER funds. Um, but in general, our staff were pretty flat, and so we saw a slight decrease there. The Title I, if you remember, that is our economically disadvantaged students. So our economically disadvantaged students, they based that funding on the number of students that applied and were accepted to free and reduced lunch. And they also used another indicator, and that is looking at um, the census population so if you look at the census figures in our district, it's also showing that our economic condition in the, the city has increased. So that's why we are seeing a decrease in those funds. So one of the things we talked about um, as a committee are how are we going to use these funds? If we look at um, our district, we have three goals um, that have carried over from last year, student achievement, climate and culture, and building the capacity of staff to be able to make a difference um, in our instruction, in our environment uh, to support students. So underneath goal one, we're proposing that um, we use our title funds to continue our title intervention. So that is our reading intervention, our title teachers that we have at the elementary schools and at the middle school. We continue with our literacy coach who provides support to those teachers. We continue with our math interventionist who provide math intervention at the elementary level for those students who are having difficulty. Required, we continued homeless support for students. Family engagement funds, we use those to, um, you know, the math night tonight, last, tonight that you saw that CGL did, that's where we get those family engagement funds. We brought the author in to do a speaking um, for our students, that's where those family engagement funds are used for. Title I Summer School and Jumpstart Summer School, which is those incoming kindergarten students, and then also funding that math coach to support our staff. If we look at the climate and culture goal, Title I professional development, um, we gotta provide professional development for our Title I teachers. They're working with our, our most needy students, so we have to make sure we have the best trained teachers doing that. And then this is really where the staff provided some input. What are those things that you need support with in your classrooms, in your schools, um, to help you do the work that you are, you're doing? The number one item th that on their list was trauma-informed practices. So they said, we have students enter our classrooms. We have content to teach them, but they're not necessarily ready to teach the content in the way we are ready to deliver it. So what do we need to do to support students that are coming from, um, have a trauma background? The second piece was restorative practices. We scratched the surface with restorative practices. I feel like we need some more support to continue that momentum. Mathematics ties over into student achievement. Mathematics, we are implementing a new uh, math program, K through five next year, uh, the reveal mathematics. So we need some professional development on how to um, get that going. Middle school ELA, um, this past year we've had a coach work with our ELA department at the middle school, our new ELA teachers, um, and came in a couple of times a month to work specifically with those teachers and that we found a lot of success in. And so we're looking to bring that in. Leadership, 
looking to provide um, leadership development for our building leaders and our grade level leaders and our department chairs. We have people in leadership positions that are being asked to do tough things. And being a leader sometimes can be lonely. Um, and they have asked for professional development on how to um, become better leaders to support their staff and to support students. And then content area PD. Um, there's a lot of PD out there, whether it be the art department or the music department, uh, the PE department, where oftentimes we don't have the expertise or the resources to provide professional development with staff in-house. And so having funds available to allow those staff uh, to access the professional development they need. And then that last column is capacity building. Those are some goals um, that are in the, some strategies that are in the first two columns that sort of go into that, over into that capacity building column. Um, you know that math coach and the literacy coach, they're providing our staff with professional development to build their capacity to support students and student achievement. And then all the professional development that we do it's really building the capacity of our staff to have an impact. Um, so those are the big chunks um, that we're looking to use our funding for. The major funds that are being used is intervention. Intervention is 90% of the funds, and that, that sort of carries over from year to year. Um, the other 10% is professional development and, and targeted to those specific areas that um, staff need. I will say that Professional development um, happens during our ear early release days, during um, the teacher workshop day. Some of those don't cost us any money because we're using in-house experts and in-house resources. Um, these are some areas where we feel we may need to pull from the outside, whether it be purchasing some text, um, having someone come in to support our folks, or sending people out to get some information to, to, to be back. Now, Part of this is we need to get some public input. So what we've done this year is we've gone through, and I'd just like to say Beth Lambert plays a significant part in putting this together. Um, but what Beth and I did is we went through, and you'll notice we have the project, the goal area, a full description of the project at this point, and then what the budget amount is for each area. And so you notice some literacy intervention, that money is paying for seven and three-fifths full-time educators. And so the budget for those three folks are 749. And if you scroll down, they're all here. The literacy coach, uh, the Title I professional development, the descriptions are there. I won't go into detail, but this will be posted tomorrow morning. So folks can go in, they can take a look at what's there. And if they have any feedback, um, they can let us know and we will use that feedback as we write the final application. What will happen is the administrative team will go into goal setting next week um, with our retreat. Uh, we'll take the public comment we have. Um, then we will sit down and we will write the funding application and then we'll send it off for uh, a final approval um, with that. Does anybody have any questions? I know there's kind of wordy and... Matt? Well, I just wanted to add, uh, remember, I think a couple meetings ago, we had our coaches come in and you saw the impact that they're having because not only are they um, doing that, the professional development in the early release days, but they're working with teachers during the day going in to be able to help, be able to come back and to be able to help them with best practice. Uh, I, I think that was, when you're able to see how we're able to, um, that's where, um, that's so helpful. That's where the needle really gets uh, moved is when, yeah, you were talking about it on Wednesday, uh, on the early release days, but now we're actually going in and working on actually implementation and putting that to work right in our classrooms. And the only other piece I want to add about the, um, as you look at the interventionist positions and the coaching positions, we have a few intervention positions, a few coaching positions that are outside of the title budget that are in our local budget because we can't afford to take everybody out of this position, out of this budget here. So I just want to bring that up when you look at um, math intervention is a good is a, a good example. We have three elementary math, math interventionists. We can only afford to take two out of the title funds. And so one is out of local funds. And so there's that blending of using local funds and title funds to meet the needs of our kids and, and what we need to do. So 
change. And I think that we're doing that strategically yep. to leverage Absolutely. the resources that we have. Yep. Steve, do you want to talk about, is it premature to talk about as we start to see how it's being uh, targeted needs and how that's decreasing and kind of what our vision is in terms of are we looking or is that, I can give it, is yeah, that premature? I can try. So right now for our Title I, so Title I reading and math, we are a targeted assistance district, which means we need to identify specific students based on educational data that need support, then we get parent permission, and then we provide those targeted students with intervention. So our interventionists that are paid out of title funds, they need to be working with those specific students, similar to special education. Special education students have a plan, the special educators, they need to be working with those specific students. With our funding, the way the trend is going currently, we are losing um, title funds. Our economic conditions in our community are improving. Um, that's what they're, they're telling us here. Um, <laughs> I think there's some disparities that the data is not capturing. Um, but that's a concern to us because as funds decrease, are we going to be able to sustain that targeted intervention model um, so we, next year, we're going to be looking at our elementary schools moving to a school-wide model um, where our interventionists could provide support to all students. And so it's a, um, it's a way where we may be able to better use uh, the limited funds we have um, moving forward. Um, so instead of working with these targeted groups, it's, it's moving to work with all students. And that will provide a little bit of flexibility. It could also allow us to, um, flexibility, I mean, students to go in and out easier, um, eliminate some of the overhead, some of the paperwork that could, takes place right now, um, and really streamlining it. Because a lot of Title um, I support and Title I leadership has, been, has come through central office through the years. But as funds um, decrease, looking to make that more building-based where the building administrators and building teachers have more ownership on those funds and how those funds are leveraged and used. So next year, it's a year's planning process. It takes nine months. Um, so that's what we'll be working on next year um, in the event that our funding continues this way. So. Amy? Oh. Amy, go ahead and then... Yeah. Um, this just, I was just triggered. Um, when we're talking about all the, the title funds and when, I wish I could go like click back to certain slides, but knowing that the high school has summer school for kids who need mm -hmm. to get credits and retake a class, and with the elementary schools, um, there's, some, so there's some summer programs, Jump Start and others. In the middle school, ages, the fifth through eighth, is there any educational program, I guess, for those ages? So originally our title funds through the years have been directed towards our elementary schools, and that was K-6. Mm -hmm. And so currently at the middle school, we have Title I um, services that are provided for students in grades five through six in literacy. Seven through eight, um, this year we've implemented trying to use a Read 180 system support to support those students in grades seven through eight, so it's not directly related to the title services. Math intervention at the elementary schools is rather, um, through the title funding, is a new, um, over the past, I think, three or four years, we've implemented that being a new program where students receive math intervention during the day. Prior to that, it was after school, and we were not having great enrollment with mm -hmm. that. So we moved to having it during the day. At the middle school, we don't have any Title I math services. Mm -hmm. Right now, ti um, it, math intervention is being handled through a uh, math interventionist through local funds. Mm -hmm. um, but the middle school is an area that intervention, we need to do more in the area of intervention. Um, and we're, you know, we're working to try to put some things into place, but really it's how do you um, best utilize the funds you have. Mm -hmm. I do have a question. Did you say that the Title I funds are based off of how many students apply for free and reduced lunch? It's based on the economic, um, economic um, students that are considered economically disadvantaged. So 
it could be solely based on our free and reduced lunch applications that are turned in. But this year, everybody had free lunch. That was and so in the state of Maine, everybody has free lunch. Right. Districts across the state were experiencing the same thing. And so you, by using the census data, in conjunction with that, um, the state was able to sort of level up our funds out um, because it could have been drastically different um, if they had not done that. So um, they used the economically, uh, economic census data as well. I had the same question, John. Paul just asked about the lunches. I thought, wait a minute, I thought it was available to everybody, so how, that must yeah. skew your, your numbers. The other is, after all this is said and done, how do you monitor or quantify the effectiveness of improvement of students? That's a good question. Improvements. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, in terms of Title I, we collect data on the students. NWA is one snapshot that we use, our standardized test scores. So we look at what, where did they start in September, where did they end in June. We also look at an informal reading assessment that we track progress. You know, this is where they were at in October. This is where they ended in December. They do monthly check-ins to make sure that students are making progress to see if the intervention is working. <clears throat> and they do similar things in math, um, NWA um, assessments, classroom-based assessments to see if students are making progress. And if students make progress, they, they get dismissed from the service. Professional development, that's a little, that's a little more ambiguous. Um, Not sure I was since it was 10% of the yeah. funds of the night. I was, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up and not me, but student, student improvement was where I was really focused. I'll say our, our um, title programming has been very effective in, in terms of helping students grow. It's been very effective. And Steve, some of those changes you talked about a few years ago with math was directly related to our data and our achievement, yep. realizing that that was not making the gains that we had by the approach we were taking. Yep. And so we put a stop to that and an overhaul to that, to uh, having it now be during the school day. Any other questions or comments or anything? Is, is the targeted assistance district kind of a new label for free and reduced community or something? What, what? No, no, is this new? No, no it's, it's, uh, it's related to Title I services. Okay. No. It's not a new term. Okay. It's just, okay. I'll add that to the list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Thanks. All right, Beth, summer professional development and student summer opportunities. And I created a couple of slides for you guys to look at too. All right, so what do we have planned for this summer? So it's um, kind of a twofold, first with students and then we also work with staff as well. So this year um, I created the same kind of brochure that I did last year and I just sent it out to um, the administrators who are pushing it out to their, their um, parents through their newsletters. And then I'll also be putting it out on Thrillshare for everybody. Some of the things we have offered again, um, we have Drama Camp for the middle school being offered again. Band Camp, which they're very excited. They have 78 band students, grades 5 through 12 signed up. They are so excited. They um, have worked to find eight musicians that will come and work specifically with different groups. There might be one working with um, brass instruments, one with percussion, one with flute, so that they're going to have some really direct instruction um, specific to what they're playing and then um, work together as a team. So the teachers are very excited about that. Um, I've put in some links to the Goodall and Springville Library activities. They always have some amazing things for students and adults. Um, they have a great adult reading program if anybody out there is interested. Um, I also have some different links that activities that families can do both inside and outside. Um, I have found in my research some really amazing virtual field trips. You can go to Williamsburg, you can um, join a bunch of different um, like aquariums around the world. So some really fun different ways. You get a rainy day and you've got the internet, you can kind of sit and travel the world a little bit. Um, and then some fun non-technology related um, activities that you can do outside. This year we did get um, a link for, it's called Read Between the Lines, and it's something that is sponsored by the New England Patriots. If you sign up, and if, 
in the brochure, there's a link. They can go and sign up and they read um, and keep a log of how much they read over the summer. And then you submit it at the end and those with the highest amount of logs will get invited to um, to an activity with some of the New England Patriots and stuff. So, and there's also, it will also continue on into the school year, which I'll make sure that I share with the teachers when the school year comes around. But I also have um, the backpack schedule, the where and when that people can um, still get food over the summer. And then our food service schedule as well. So I tried to do like I did last year and kind of keep it all in one spot um, to make it easier for families to access it. And then the other part of my summer is teacher professional learning opportunities. I sent out a survey back in March asking teachers what they felt um, after this year with their students, what they felt they needed um, some extra learning opportunities on for this summer as well as moving forward into next school year. Uh, we have several book studies going on this summer. I'm really excited about it. We have one that specifically looks at um, supporting ninth graders. I believe we have 23 high school teachers signed up for that, so I'm really excited about that. A couple to deal with um, working with math. You know how Eric talked about it's okay for students to experience that math struggle. There's a book, um, one of the book studies is about that, so teachers can understand a little better. It's okay to let your students struggle a little bit. That's where a lot of the learning happens. Um, we have some special ed training. Um, we have some executive functioning training. That's something that's been really asked for from our staff K to 12. So Jess Folsom will be offering, um, I believe it's K to 5 and a 6 through 12 training. We're looking at strong starts in writing this year is kind of our focus. So we've got some specific training for K to 2 and 3 to 5 there. And then we also are working again further with some restorative practices. Steve and I met with George Conan and we're going to continue working with our staff on circles for the social emotional connection, but also how can you use that kind of con that um, the circle practice for your content to have discussions for some, you know, activating thoughts um, before unit. So that's on the agenda. And then finally, I worked with several other um, curriculum directors in York County, and we're offering a summer institute. Uh, this summer, and it's August 17th, 18th, and 19th. It's 100% virtual. Any of our staff can sign up for whatever they want. There are, um, um, there are activities or trainings from just a one hour to two full days, depending on what you want. And so they can pick and choose what they like. Um, and so what it is, is everybody from those different districts kind of chip in a little bit of funds to cover it, and then all of their staff can attend for free. Um, so, and this is the first year that we've been a part of it, so I'm really excited about it. So that's kind of what we've got going for students and staff this summer. Do you have any questions? I just want to add in, one of the challenges that we've had is um, hiring for mm -hmm. people to be able to come back and offer programming um, uh, for our students in the summer. Um, we really got out in front of a lot of the uh, extended school year and the Title I summer school and the Jump Start, where we've got a lot of our people who are interested in doing that. But it also comes back into, as I know, we try to have the connections with the YMCA and the connections with the uh, rec department as well, that in those areas we're trying to be able to also fill those to the levels that we had them last year. Some areas were being successful, but in some other ones we're running under some challenges right now about uh, interest and availability of the people. And that's just, um, I don't think that's unique to Sanford. I think that's a challenge that um, a lot of districts are facing when it comes to trying to provide programming outside of the school year into the summer. Anybody have comments or no? No? I think it's awesome. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Very exciting. Thank you. Okay, moving on to new business. We've got a few recommendations. Um, Matt, you want to start with summer nominations? Yeah, the first one is I wanted to get this on uh, for this meeting. Uh, we are having a, our, we are planning our second meeting in June uh, that we had to reschedule because of the Juneteenth holiday. But after that meeting, uh, I did want to have the opportunity uh, for, uh, for me to be able to offer, offer teaching contracts during June, July, and August uh, for any of the unfilled positions. Our administrators are doing a really good job 
uh, as we're trying to get out in front of the hiring to be able to present that, but is when the openings do come up in those areas, that's something that when we're in competition with other people, it's always good where we can offer that out because we're not scheduled to meet right now in July. Um, at our next school committee meeting, I will be putting out a, um, a, a school committee meeting calendar for next year. And one of the things that we have added based on feedback is some August meetings to get them on the calendar because we always end up meeting in August um, with that. So that would be helpful to learn from that and get that out. But this would allow after our last meeting on June 16th, that I would then be able to, in those situations, offer the contracts uh, with that. And that's similar to what we've done, um, that's been done in previous years. I'm looking for a nominee, um, motion. John? Second. John seconded, any discussion? All right, all in favor? All in favor. Next recommendation, Cheryl. Hello. So first up is the financials for April. Um, looking at the dashboard section. Oh, Sarah's already got up there. Awesome. So uh, I just wanted to say I'll kind of talk through some of the stuff that's in the memo in regards to looking at the graphs. I figure we'll take it that way. Um, so I'm not reading word for word um, the whole memo. Um, you can read that if you like. <laughs> so um, the. Uh, Expense budget is um, at just about at actual. Um, we're right running um, pretty darn close. Um, so I think we're like $25,000 difference between taking the average spend rate over the past two years and this year, we're right about $25,000 difference. So we're really running in the right direction. Um, and then for revenue, we're, of course, we're running at a higher than we have in the past, but that's mostly due to the EPS fin funding or the ED279. That amount came in substantially higher, so we're running about $0.6 million higher than um, we did in the past. So when you get down into the federal grants, um, that makes up about $1.8 million worth of revenue or $1.9 million worth of expenses. And if you look, um, most of it is running just one month behind because we bill it out. Um, actually, Fader already billed out the month of May um, this week. Um, and if she hasn't finished it, she's going to do it by probably the end of day tomorrow. Um, she's right on the board, um, doing an awesome job at keeping us up to date. Uh, she's very proud of herself. She's caught us all up on all of those federal fundings. And then when you look at our enterprise fund, which is our blue graphs, um, it's $1.9 million worth of revenue and $1.7 million worth of expenses. And so everything's running uh, normally as they do there. Uh, ESSER funds, we're still struggling on getting our ESSER fund invoices through. Um, I'm actually now having Phaedra help me um, since she's got all the other ones up to date. I'm gonna have her help me get these ones up to date. Um, it's just a lot of time and effort to get it organized before you can even send it to them. And you can only upload 10 pages at a time. And there's probably a stack of invoices like this for every billing. So as you can imagine, it takes some time and effort to upload each of these pieces. And then when they have a question, it's then you have to tear it apart and re-upload. So it, it, it can take some time. So I've gotten Fader on board kind of training her and she's going to start taking this over to help me out. So who is they and who's Phaedra? Oh, <laughs> Phaedra is our staff accountant that um, we hired back in December. And uh, she has um, really turned it all around. I, I'm very impressed and uh, very happy that she's on board because it's really relieved me quite a bit. Um, and then uh, they, which is uh, the Department of Education, um, just it's it's really a struggle, and I think well, I'm not the only, we're not the only town having struggles getting our invoices through. Um, they did just open it up so we can bill out three months at a time, which is awesome. So we're hoping that will help, but that's also three months worth of invoices that you have to then upload all at one time. So, but it at least then doesn't hold you up. You can start building the next one and having it ready, so that once they've done it, you can upload. 
I just haven't had the time to do that. So um, Phaedra will actually be taking that over and hopefully that will help get our invoices up to date. Um, so that's $1.7 million worth of revenue and $3.5 million worth of expenses. But you're also gonna think that's over 50 employees, actually it's more than that, I think when you actually get down to it. Um, so the expenses are over a half a million to a million depending on the month of how much money is going through there a month. Um, so it, it gets pretty hefty. When you say positions, those are the ESSER positions. All the that ESSER we have. positions. Yep. So there's a lot of money, a lot of people going through that, and so it does take some time and have to get signatures from everybody in time and effort. And then um, we have some other major grants, which is your Perkins, your COPS grants, your RUS grants. Um, that's about four, uh, $0.4 million worth of revenue and $0.5 million worth of expenses. Um, a couple of these we actually don't bill until the end. Um, or that we bill them when we get enough money to go and pull it down. But we're working those through too. Um, so then when you click on to the next groupings, this is taking all your articles and just showing you them budget to actual based on the percentage of spend rate in the past. If you look through, just about everything is running right around budget, and which is why we're $25,000 from budget if you look at the front page. So. Everything seems to be running on schedule. Um, Article 9 looks like we're spending a lot more, but I think that one is mostly because we actually used a lot of it that we hadn't in the past due to COVID. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, debt is 100% spent because we've paid all of our payments out for um, all of our loans, our pass-through loans are through Article 10. And so we're, I think we're in good shape. And any questions on that? Cheryl, uh, so the, these are the April financials, which means we still have uh, the May financials, and then we also have June. Uh, that'll get us to the end. Do you have, uh, it sounds like, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it and, and for that, that when it comes to where we are to budget, we're pretty close. So in terms of if you're looking at Mm -hmm. uh, carry over uh, for anything that way right now uh, we're not expecting to not be much. able to have carry over be able which is different from what we've had in the last couple of years correct due to, COVID. due to covid we had substantial amounts yes question John? Yeah, what about it seems like we've seen the word retirement with asterisks beside it this year within the union contract there are per diem or per day payouts for those teachers that have, could have several days mm -hmm. is that we, um, that was part of the budgeting process. We actually had that amount. Um, God, I'm gonna, now you're trying to rack my brain. It went up like $26,000 for last year. That's why we asked for them to give us their um, intent to retire by January 15th so that we could do that because we pay those out in July and so we have those already calculated pretty much based on if they had Worst case scenario, because it was as of that day that they gave their retirement, so they could have used some of their time since then, so that could have brought it down some. And the people who retired after that, my understanding is they're still going to get that benefit, but it will be a year from now? A year later, yes. Yeah, with that, so that helps us be able to Like Joan Wright's a good example. Yep. <laughs> yep. Any other comments or discussion? Okay. Looking for... Yeah, good. Okay, looking for a motion to approve the April 2022 financials as presented. So moved. So moved, seconded. Okay, all in favor? Mm -hmm. All in favor. Last one, RFQ for audiovisual services, RSUS grant retraction. Right, so as you remember, I brought this forward last time, and um, in the midst of Joan leaving to go on vacation and everything, she was working behind the scenes and didn't realize when she told me it was all set that she wasn't really 100% all set because she started hearing from the other towns that things were missing out of the pro-AV um, bid. And some of those things, once you added them up, would actually make it so the bid would have been higher than the, how do you, if the, Vodavai, 
company. <laughs> and I'm like, so when we actually talked about it and, and everything, we felt like it's best to pull us, pull it back, retract it, and re-up for the other company for the $851,000 bid. Um, and then we also, um, it actually gives us an added benefit, um, which is kind of cool that it actually has this other warranty on it that they'll come and fix the item right on site, which is a huge benefit for a couple of these smaller towns because they don't really have the IT staff, so it helps them a great deal. Um, and it will benefit from it because we can actually utilize it too. Um, so that's one really good thing about this. Um, and there was another piece I wanted to say. Um, but, um, oh, uh, so a couple of the other towns have used this other company. We just haven't used this company. They said they're, they're really um, organized, very great follow through. So we're not as concerned because we didn't realize that some of the other companies had used them and that's why they ended up bidding on it because the other towns they've actually done work for. So um, uh, Joan has had multiple conversations with both vendors, with other um, of the other towns too, to make sure this is the right way to go because we didn't know the company so it made it kind of difficult for us um, but after having all the discussions and finding out all the items that were missing, it just is the right way to go. Any questions? It's, I mean, I appreciate your plight because <clears throat> it sounds like they're going to be on site for services, if, presuming they're, you know, competently staffed and so forth. So, because uh, yeah. anywhere else in society today, it's, that's not the case. So, <laughs> right. wish you my best. <laughs> Hopefully they have the right staff. <laughs> Very true. John Paul? Uh, was the Pro AV Systems the company that installed the high school boards and all that stuff? I, I, um, I don't know if they installed them all. But Some supply. of them. <laughs> Matt might be able to speak to that no, better they, yeah, they, they were a vendor that we used. They were also a vendor that we used with um, the Performing Arts Center. And so... Uh, as you could tell, initially, they, we've had a pretty good working relationship with them mm -hmm. in terms of they've been pretty responsive as we've been able to come back and, and uh, anything that's coming back that wasn't up to what we needed or, or spec, we were able to come back and do that. Mm -hmm. Did that include the active boards? I don't think so. I, don't, I think that was a different company that different was coming company. in to be here. Um, and one of the things that they will do is training, which is kind of great. And we're gonna we're working on trying to set that up um, for one of the teacher PD professional development items, because there's other people that can benefit from that training. So we're trying to get them to do it for all the new staff that are going to get them that haven't had them before, and any new staff, of course, that haven't used them, and current staff can also join those. So. It's kind of an added benefit. Okay. Any other questions or comments or anything? I'm going to read this whole thing so that we're clear as to what's going on. So I'm looking for a motion to retract the goods and services agreement to Pro AV Systems for $723,132.42 as approved on 523.22 and approve replacement bid from Vodivai. Technologies for $851,716.05 as presented by Cheryl. Join me. I would like to make the motion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Amy makes Shall the motion I? seconded by. <laughs> yeah. Seconded. Okay. All in favor? All in favor. Thank you. Well, I remember when I was sitting there, and I'd be like, I want to, I'd like to make a motion. Oh, there alone. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did make a mental note that I was not going to do that. <laughs> okay. No old business, and now we're moving on to resignations and retirements. Sure. I'd like to announce the following resignation retirements. Mona Lamb, retiring from lead kitchen personnel at the high school. Uh, Eleanor Merrick, uh, from Title I uh, throughout the di uh, district. Uh, Carrie Martin 
and Jamie Lantain, uh, kitchen personnel, Carrie at CJL, Jamie at Sanford Middle School, uh, those are resignations. Uh, Lance Tiberlake, resignation as a social studies teacher at the high school as he's moving up to a district up north. Cindy Finney, a seventh and eighth grade resource room teacher. I'd like on, the, on our agenda, the date there is June 10th, 2022. That was a misprint. It should be September 1st, uh, 2022. And I'm also uh, pleased to announce that Cindy will not be, um, she's leaving that position, but we are gonna be uh, nominating her for another position at our next meeting. So uh, that's good. Brittany McClure resigning as a school counselor at MCS. Uh, she's heading to Nashville, Tennessee. Alexia Ortega resigning as administrative assistant at Pride and William Zahn as the plumbing teacher at SRTC. I do want to thank Mona Lamb and Eleanor Merrick for all of their efforts. Uh, very long time employees to the Sanford School Department. Ellie has served in many different uh, capacities. Uh, been a huge asset to the district. Uh, very helpful for us. I think as Steve was talking about Title I, uh, Ellie's had a big role in that in our intervention system and Ellie's also staying on right up through the end of the summer uh, for be able to come back and do that. So big recognition to Mona uh, and Ellie for all of their contributions to the Sanford School Department. Got some uh, appointments to mention. Uh, Beth was talking about some of the summer programming coming up. We have a number of people for the summer band uh, program as summer band coaches. Dee Ames, Linda Valancourt, Jean Quinn, Gabe Reed, Alyssa Gill, Heather Hastings, Megan Menino, Haley Francor, Erica Scarano. You uh, know that uh, you heard Beth talk about how those numbers are increasing, and uh, that's, um, that's awesome. And I think this is also, uh, going to also help uh, overall with that because that's where the interest is. Uh, also, Caleb Randall and the Performing Arts Center to help Brett out as an event manager. Jamie Lovejoy returning back to us in the uh, student support and transition uh, room at Margaret Chase Smith School as an Ed Tech 3. Uh, I'd like to nominate Kristen Montesano as a library Ed Tech uh, at Sanford Middle School. Uh, she comes to us with a lot of library background, um, excited for that. Uh, no, Nicole Tibbetts, hiring her as a substitute for our custodians. Uh, we're also pleased with that. Nicole was working with us with a custodian, but then left to go to an ed tech job during the school year. But it looks like she's going to be able to be helping us out throughout the summer. And also um, Lindsay Strout as the assistant cross-country coach for those appointments. Also, some transfers to announce. Uh, Gwen Towns will be moving uh, from a kindergarten teacher at Pride to the pre-K teacher at Pride. Uh, so uh, congratulations for Gwen to that. Excited about that. Deanna Morrow moving from an ESSER position at kindergarten at MCS, moving into a kindergarten position that's non-ESSER, that's in the local budget. We'd like to see that. Those are the people that we're bringing in in those ESSER positions that are being able to uh, stay as other positions open up. Uh, Sharon uh, Bonanno, uh, ESSER Kindergarten Literacy Ed Tech 2 at MCS. She's going to be a pre-K Ed Tech at MCS. Heather Gagney, uh, Kitchen Personnel. She's at the middle school right now for 4.25 hours, and we're going to increase that to five hours. And also announcing uh, Marty Kane from uh, Sanford Middle School, special education teacher moving up to the high school uh, for the health and physical education uh, position, uh, replacing Diana Walker. I met with Marty we, uh, uh, to go over that uh, for her, uh, to look at her background and need for doing that. So I'm happy to approve that transfer. And then in terms of nominations that we're gonna need uh, for um, school committee action, uh, as I mentioned, our uh, administrators have been doing a nice job uh, getting out in front of their hiring. I enjoy um, you know, meeting with all of these people uh, from the recommendations and then offering them the positions. So I'd like to nominate the following professional staff. Uh, Katie Spagnolo, a general music teacher at Sanford Middle School. Lauren Brown is a fourth grade teacher at MCS. Leah Daniels is a grade five teacher at the middle school. Travis Crudson, math teacher at the high school. Brandy Devine, pre-K teacher at Margaret Chase Smith School. Kendra uh, Sherman, um, 
pre-K teacher uh, at Carl J. Lamb, Brooke Letterer, grade three classroom teacher, uh, Tanya Walterbeek, health and phys ed teacher at Carl J. Lamb. Um, I should have Chris Kumpka, um, yeah, he's, he's a transfer, but we'll be transferring him to grade seven, social studies teacher at the middle school. And Derek Moore, he's currently in a Nestor position as a math teacher, and he's gonna be moving over to a, a regular math teacher at the middle school. So looking to um, have a, nom a nomination for these professional staff to present them with a one-year probationary contract. I'd ask that we take Chris Kumka out of there and move Chris to the transfer because he will not be on a, um, he'll be transferring from a, a grade five position to a grade seven social studies uh, teacher position. So I apologize that I didn't catch that in advance. And so we'll nominate everyone, but uh, we will not nominate Chris because he will not be on a one-year probationary contract. He will be on a second-year probationary contract for that. Can we get a motion? Amy. Mm -hmm. I would love to make a motion. All right. Seconded by? John Rue gets the honor. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? All in favor. And then uh, finally, also nominating our administrators. Uh, this is probably, I should have done this back in our last meeting in May. Typically what we do is in the first meeting in May, we nominate our first year probationary to second year probationary, and we nominate second probationary to continuing contract. So here is uh, our administrators, Mike Bailey, middle, middle school assistant principal, Sherry Barron, Carl J. Lamb principal, Stacy Bissell, special education director, for the district, Mark Bisson, Margaret Chase Smith School Assistant Principal, Kristen Daly, Assistant Principal at Sanford Pride, Tammy Delaney, a District Assistant Special Ed Director, Amanda Doyle, Sanford High School Assistant Principal, Tracy Hallisey, Principal at MCS, Susan Inman, Inman Principal at Sanford Pride, Bethany Lambert, Director of Curriculum, uh, Trish Leak, Carl J. Lamb, Assistant Principal, Pam Lydon, Middle School Principal, Joe Mastracchio, Middle School Assistant Principal, Jane Perkins, the uh, Community Adult Education Director, Matt Peterman, High School Principal, Mike Redman, SRTC Assistant Director, Gordy Sauls, uh, for the uh, Athletic Director for the District, Kathy Sargent, SRTC Director, Aaron Tremblay, Sanford High School Assistant Principal, and Troy Watt, Sanford High School Assistant Principal. Okay, looking for a motion. I would like to make a motion. Okay, Amy, we need a seconded. Thank you, Mr. Mapes. All in favor? <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> All right, next item is policies and procedures. We're gonna have the second reading for the Family Medical Leave Act. Correct, policy GBN, which is the Family Medical Leave Act policy. Policy GBN is a required policy. The revised policy has been updated to include new categories of family members included under Maine's Family Medical Leave Law, which became effective in October. And the revised po policy also includes federal military caregiver leave, which has been added since the last time the policy was updated. The revised policy also simplifies our current procedures that are in place. We have procedure GBN-R1 and procedure GBN-R2. And in the new policy, we have incorporated the, um, the guidance or the law that we're formally in our procedures to make it more efficient and effective in communicating that to our staff. And I recommend approval. Questions? Comments? Amy, would you like I would. to do the motion? I would okay. Like to make the motion. <laughs> make the motion. Seconded by one of the gentlemen to my left, Rue, Mr. Rue, and all in favor? All in favor. We have no items for future agendas, do we? No? Okay, calendar announcements, Mr. Nelson. Sure, so um, tomorrow our final pre-K advisory team meeting. Also tomorrow, as I mentioned, will be step up days for grade five coming into the middle school, grade eight going to the high school. Also tomorrow is our bridge graduation. That's at 12.15 uh, if people are able to make it over at Anderson Learning Center for that. Uh, as mentioned, the Sanford High School graduation is this Wednesday. That'll be 6 p.m. at Alumni Stadium. 
I did talk to uh, the meteorologist we contract with, and it looks like there's rain in the forecast Wednesday morning, uh, getting done early afternoon. And so um, there might be a pop-up shower or two um, in the area, but I'll be following up with him tomorrow because our intentions are to be able to hold that uh, at Alumni Stadium. Uh, also, the eighth grade celebration uh, for them and their dance uh, will be Thursday this week. And our, as mentioned, our last day of school is Friday, June 10th. And also want to take time to announce that, uh, just a reminder, that the school budget uh, voter referendum is, that's going to be a week from tomorrow, Tuesday, June 14th. That'll be all day at the various polling places in the city. So a reminder for people to get out to be able to uh, take action and vote on the, um, on the school budget. If you're not able to vote on June 14th, there is absentee voting that is taking place currently right here at City Hall uh, with Sue Cody, and that I'm pretty sure is gonna be going right up through this Friday, uh, if you can have absentee uh, voting uh, in terms of that. So um, just a reminder for people to get out into the polls. Okay. Oh, and last thing, our next meeting in June, uh, as mentioned before, we couldn't do it on uh, Monday, June 20th, as that's going to be the Juneteenth holiday. So we are looking at Thursday, June 16th at 6 p.m. John, I know you're out of town, but Thursday, June 16th, as far as I know, works for the other four members. Um, so we will be doing that. In that agenda, we'll be looking at uh, NWEA data uh, for how our students did in the spring. We're also hoping that we can get Grace and Bella to come as we recognize them for all of their contributions as student reps. Uh, and the other thing is looking at a meeting schedule for the school committee to make, uh, take formal action on that for our 2022-2023 meeting dates. So that'll be Thursday, June 16th, 6 p.m. Okay. Thank you. Make a motion to end the meeting at Amy. Yes. Oh, yes. seven thirty-five. <coughs> Motion made by Amy Sivany, seconded by everybody. Yeah. Apparently, okay. All in favor? All in favor.